non-ideal gases. So real gases often do not behave like ideal gases. In fact, there really is no such thing as an ideal gas. So we learned about the ideal gas law and that we can calculate the pressure and the volume and the temperature and the amount of moles um, and that any ideal gas will file, follow the ideal gas law. Well, it turns out that no real gas, no actual gas, is actually ideal. An ideal gas is just kind of a, a, um, a fiction that we use to make our equation work really well. But it turns out that when I put in real gases um, and start measuring pressure and volume and temperature and the amount of moles in certain conditions, the numbers aren't always the same. So for example, if we look at this chart down here, we know that the molar volume of one mole of gas at STP is equal to 22.4 liters in an ideal gas. So when I look at Cl2 gas, um, it's actually, I, when I measure how much one mole, the volume of one mole, it's actually 22 liters, 22.06 liters. CO2 is a little bit off. NH3 is pretty close, but not quite, not exact. N2 is close, but not exact. HE is, is exactly the same as the ideal gas. H2 is close, but not exact. So um, real gases are not ideal. Uh, and we'll see why, because there are some um, assumptions that we, that we have to provide when we think about what an ideal gas is. So ideal gases have no attractions between gas molecules. So what that means is that they are really just like pool balls. So on a pool table, the pool balls do not act like magnets at all. They don't have any attraction toward each other. The only time they're going to hit each other is if you send one careening toward the others. So um, they, uh, it, when we're thinking about an ideal gas, we would think the particles are the same way, that they're not like magnets at all and they have no attraction between particles. They're not going to be sticky toward each other at all. Um, and another assumption that we make when we think about ideal gases is that the particles themselves take up have no volume at all. They don't have any space. So the entire volume of the gas sample is um, made up of particles that themselves have no volume. So those two assumptions are not ever true for any gas. All gases have some slight attraction between gas molecules and we'll talk about that more as we go on um, in the next couple of chapters. Um, and all all particles take up space. Even the smallest particle, even a hydrogen atom takes up space. Even a proton takes up space. Even an electron takes up space. So the assumption that the gas molecules don't take up any space at all is easily violated by every particle because every particle takes up space. So the point is that there is no such thing as an ideal gas that has these two things that are true all real gases, these two things are false. They, all real gases have attractions and the gas molecules do take up space. So when we're thinking about the ideal gas law though, it's still very useful because when um, we have uh, very high temperatures and very low pressures of gas, then the ideal gas law holds for most gases. It's true for most gases. But when the temperatures are low and the pressures are high, then the ideal gas law breaks down for pretty much every gas. It doesn't work anymore. So um, at low pressures, the molar volume of argon is nearly identical to that of an ideal gas, which means that when there is not many argon particles in a box, then we can assume that those particles have almost no volume because there aren't very many of them in there and the box is generally pretty large compared to the particles. But as the pressure increases and I'm adding more and more particles of argon into this box, then the molar volume becomes greater than that of an ideal gas, which just means that as more and more particles are added to the box, the, 
the volume of the particles themselves starts to become important. It starts to become a significant amount of the volume of the box. So um, in what it, we would expect an ideal gas to do, what we would expect the molar volume of an ideal gas to do as we increase the pressure by either decreasing the volume or adding another gas or something, if we increase the pressure, then the molar volume we would expect to decrease like this in an ideal gas. But for argon, it decreases like this. And you might say, well, that's pretty nitpicky. Those curves look pretty close. And they are really close. Argon is pretty close to an ideal gas. But it's not exact. Um, and neither is helium, which is also pretty close to an ideal gas. And what do um, helium and argon have in common? Well, they're noble gases. And noble gases are pretty close to ideal gases. Uh, but because real molecules take up space, the molar volume of a real gas is always going to be slightly larger than the ideal gas law predicts because we're, we have the volume of the particles themselves. So uh, a man named Johannes van der Waals uh, was uh, researching this equation and realized that these assumptions of the ideal gas law were not entirely valid. And so the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, although very valuable, doesn't quite hold for real gases. So van der Waals wanted to make an equation that would actually predict the volume of a real gas and actually predict the pressure of a real gas, not just um, an ideal gas, but for any gas. So in order to change the equation, the volume of an ideal gas is always too small because the volume of an ideal gas assumes that the particles have no volume. But the particles do have a volume. So the volume of, according to the ideal gas law, looks like this. But that's too small. So what do I do? The volume, according to van der Waals, looks like this. And I have to add a little bit. And this factor right here, nb, accounts for the volume of the particles themselves. This volume assumes the particles have no, take up no volume, take up no space. Well, they do take up space. How much? This little tiny amount here, nb. And b is, a, is called a van der Waals constant. And b is um, different for every particle. We would have to calculate what b is. It basically tells us how big is that particle? How much space does it take up? And n is just the same as moles. Moles here and moles here times b, which is the size of the particle. But it's not just the volume that's wrong. Because remember, the ideal, an ideal gas has two assumptions that are incorrect. First, that the particles take up no space. The volume is too small. But also that the particles have no attraction to each other. And so in an ideal gas, the particles are like billiard balls. And they just bounce right off each other. And they don't have any attraction to each other. But that's not true of a real gas. In a real gas, these aren't perfectly elastic collisions. When the gas particles hit each other, they are sticky a little bit. They hit each other. And they kind of stick together for a moment. And then they bounce off and go their, their way. So some of the energy of the collision is absorbed by the molecules. So what that means is that if I'm imagining this sample of gas where the particles are like billiard balls and they just bounce right off of each other, then when they bounce right off of each other after that collision, they're going to be going fast. And if they hit each other and they stick a little bit, then they're going to be going slower. So if they don't stick, they're going to be going faster. They'll bounce right off. And if they do stick a little bit, they're going to be going slower after that collision. So what does that mean? Well, it means that in an ideal gas, the pressure, oops, the pressure is too high. Because in an ideal gas, where we're imagining those gas particles like billiard balls, after that collision, the ideal gas law says that the particles are going faster than they really are. Because the ideal gas law says that they are like billiard balls, and they bounce right off. But they don't bounce right off. If they stick a little bit, then the pressure is going to go down, because those particles are going to move a little bit slower. 
How much does the pressure go down? By this much. N over V, so moles divided by volume squared, times this factor A, which is another van der, van der Waals constant. And A tells us how sticky are the particles. So in an ideal gas, particles take up no volume, but we know they do, so we have to add this factor. In an ideal gas, particles bounce right off of each other, and so they go quickly after a perfectly elastic collision, so the pressure is too high. But we know in a real gas, they're a little bit sticky. So how sticky are they? Well, for every particle, it's a little different, and we use this factor to decrease the pressure. So this is what the ideal gas law looks like after we add van der Waals constants, van der Waals modifications. Um, and this equation right here will help us to calculate the pressure and the volume and the temperature of real gases instead of ideal gases. And we just have to look up A and B in a table. For example, helium has this value for A and has this value for B. And these values have been calculated and so we can use this equation um, for real gases instead of the, this is like the, the real gas law instead of the ideal gas law. So when we look at what real gases do relative to an ideal gas, in an ideal gas um, we would have uh, PV over RT uh, uh, plotted by pressure would be a perfectly linear relationship kind of like this helium line right here um, and kind of like this neon line right here. But what we can see is that um, helium is pretty close to ideal, being a noble gas and being very small. Neon is pretty close to ideal, being a noble gas and being pretty small. But uh, even argon, as it, which is a noble gas, starts to get kind of a curve here a little bit. Um, and xenon uh, is, has a, a big curve. H2O drops down this way a lot. And an ideal gas is a perfectly straight line uh, that doesn't have any slope. So real gases, um, no real gas, even helium, which is really close, no real gas behaves exactly like an ideal gas because ideal gases aren't real.